God. What what day is it today for you? Uh, Saturday. Uh, Sunday. Saturday. Sunday. Okay. okay. Sunday sixteen. Yeah. What what time is it? Six a.m. Six a.m. Okay. Yeah, yeah we're, we're at the same time. Oh yeah. What are the others? Yeah, that's why I'm wondering too. Oh. Yeah. My time is quick. And I, and I think my date is correct. <laughs> Here, Here we, we are. Perfect. Good morning, Olivia. Holly, good morning. Okay, we'll give we'll give these people about another five minutes, then we just start. Oli, I got I got your email about the things that the days that you will be absent. Good morning, Nolan and Ahmed. Holly, good morning, Ahmed. Yeah. Morning, beautiful. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> she walked away. She came to say hi and left. <laughs> okay, if we give him a bob, another two minutes to show up, and then we'll get going. All right, guys, let's do this. So um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for another session. Thank you so much for um, attending the class today. So uh, today we're going to cover chapter five and chapter six, uh, which they are already available in Moodle. 
I've seen that some of you guys have been having problems with Moodle, but um, it's been up whole weeks, uh, the, the PowerPoints. Um, just so you guys know, the first uh, assignment is going to be given to you guys once we complete chapter number seven, which will be number, which will be uh, next week. Um, and then and then we uh, that will be the first assignment, which is a, a quiz of 10 questions based on the seven uh, PowerPoints that we already had by that point. So it will be next week once we finish uh, next Sunday. Um, a quick review of what happened last week and what we learned. It's um, let me just pull it down right here. We talked about integrity, integrity about the quality of being honest and having a strong moral principles and moral uprightness. So pretty much differentiating between what is right and what is wrong. And then uh, kind of like one of the conclusion is doing what is right and not what is just convenient because we could do a lot of the things that are convenient, but they are not necessarily right. They're not, for example, the right decision to make because it could hurt somebody or it could, you know, damage somebody in general. So, so that's what integrity is. And that's one of the, the, the soft skills that we talked about last week. Now, uh, we also talked about marketing plans and marketing plans, how they could change how they're not set in stone. And, and we also talk about strategies. Strategies can change depending on your internal and external environment in regards to marketing. So um, marketing plan is something that you said when you, when you start the year or um, before, let's say, for example, I'm already planning for next year, uh, starting October, right? Next year, but I started in October to make sure that I get all all approvals necessary, and then I can go ahead and, and make sure that next year we start really good. And like you guys saw, it's a plan, but it usually changes throughout the year, depending on what happens. Uh, a clear example is COVID-19. Um, you could have started with the plan, but everything went different because the external environment changed. But our goal didn't change, which is, for example, making profits, right? So um, uh, we also cover internal and external environments, which affect the plans. And then we also came down to the conclusion that objectives are very specific and goals are very broad. And you have one goal, but you have multiple obje objectives to be able to meet that goal. Um, so that's pretty much the review from yesterday, uh, from last Sunday that we cover, right? Internal, external environments, how they affect plans, integrity, doing the, doing what's right and not what's uh, convenient, and then how marketing plans and how marketing um, strategies change depending on the internal and external environment. Okay, so. Um, any questions on that? Akmek, good morning too. All right, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with chapter number five and uh, chapter number five. So I'm gonna share my screen. And once again, let me know if you guys see it or not. Please confirm that you guys see my screen. Good on my side. OK, perfect. All right, same we're here. Gonna go with, but thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go with chapter number five. So we have covered chapter one through four already. Um, can you guys um, somebody that confirms that you guys have been able to see the whole all of the PowerPoints already in Moodle? I mean, one through seven, I believe. Do have somebody that could uh, confirm that you guys have one through seven and on on Moodle? All right. 
One second, I'm on it right now. Yeah, no problem. Has any of you guys access it? I know Ahmed, Ahmed, you have asked for them. Um, Give the link, have you asked? Yes, they are, okay. Yeah, no assignments yet, no. I just wanted to make sure that- uh, Yeah, I can see the all seven PowerPoints, right? Okay, yep, 100%, perfect. Yeah, there's no assignments yet, but those that's your first to review. Like I said, the first assignment is gonna come next Sunday and it's going to be a quiz of 10 questions that is going to be based out of these seven PowerPoints, okay? So the questions come out of these PowerPoints. So make sure that uh, you have your PowerPoints on the side and then you have the quiz to make sure that, you know, double check. Um, okay, so pretty much right here, what we're gonna cover is marketing analysis and CRM. So as you, as you guys already know, CRM is a customer relationship management software or it could be a concept. It, it could be just as simple as uh, the management of customers in general, the life of a customer. And and what we're trying to find out based on uh, customer relationship management software or system is to make sure that we get our return on marketing investment, how much money we spend on marketing and how much money we are getting back per customer. So we cannot generalize, but we can need we need to know how much money we're getting per customer in general. So um, with that said, let's move on right here to objectives and capabilities of CRM. Nobody owns the CRM. Every single department um, takes advantage of it because everybody it's input and information. So think of it as um, think of it as recording your your customer name and then the, in that specific software, you have their address, and then based on their address, you know when they purchased last, when uh, what the location is, if we have any vendors close by them, and if, if we have any distributors, and then when was the first time they purchased, the second time they purchased, uh, the type of the amount of money that they bought from us, and things like that. So um, it's pretty much. Uh, it, it tracks the whole life of the customer. That's what it is. So, um, and it drives the firm to be customer centric, right? So uh, at the end of the whole conclusion is how can you be more connected to your customers? And it doesn't necessarily have to be by you talking to them every day. It could be just you pulling up the information um, up just to know that um, when was the last time they purchased and you need to contact them again. So you have their email, their phone number uh, right in front of you and you know the whole history. So what are the objectives of this specific software is uh, to acquire new customers, right? Customer acquisition and then customer retention, right? Why? Because we need to know if they are loyable and, they, uh, and they're satisfied, right? Depending on how often do they buy and what type of reviews they could give us, right? And so, for example, every interaction that I have with the customer, I can make some notes on the CRM. So this, I called him and he said he was satisfied with the product, right? I called him, but he called me back for a warranty. Um, he emailed me saying that he hated the product or things like that. So that those are part of the notes that you make as a sales rep. And then also, in general, the company is going to be able to see all of it. Um, like, for example, uh, for marketing purposes, I need to know if this person is really going to buy again or not, because I'm going to email him saying, hey, there's a promotion or things like that. So depending on that, depending on the interactions that you've had with the customer, then it leaves, it leaves me some opportunity to contact them from my marketing standpoint. So customer profitab profitability. So it's the right products at the right time. The reason why they say that is because if we target them with the wrong product, knowing what we know about the customer, let's say we sell shoes and this guy has been buying all tennis shoes, why am I going to send him an a email campaign with basketball shoes, right? It has to be more direct to, you know, the type of, uh, the type of person and the type of customer. So. 
ask me at any time if, if you have any questions. Okay, so uh, customer satisfaction, it's, it's pretty much means that the offering meets or exceeds the customer expectations. Um, so these are the two things that we're looking for, customer loyalty and customer satisfaction. Do we want to put our bar, set our bar, bar really low? It depends because sometimes when you are trying to exceed the customer expectations, you really have to say, okay, for example, our delivery time could be one week, but for us, it's better to say two weeks. So when they, when they get it, they, they're they happy because they got it before, right? Or customer satisfaction and customer loyalty could come actually from moments that are not so happy. For example, warranty, when they're having a life problem, right? When they cannot fix it themselves, they could just call us and then we could go ahead and solve it, right? And that gives a little bit more customer satisfaction because now they buy it but they know that they called you and they contact you and they get um, a good customer service right away. So that's customer loyalty. They can say, you know, I don't, I don't buy from them because the product is the best, but I know I do buy from them because I call them and they fix them right away. So um, customer success concepts in this area, it's customer uh, value co-creation, customer experience management, customer empowerment, right? So it's all customer oriented, right? It's how can I create, um, based on their likes, create some type of offerings of value that I can give them, right? So I know if that person buys tennis shoes because they play tennis, then I could create some type of um, offering that gives them, you know, more money, more, more value for, for their money. Uh, customer experience and management right here. You want to make sure that every encounter that they have with you, it's satisfying, right? You want to make sure that they, every time they talk to the, to somebody in your company, they have a good experience. Customer empowerment, right? A lot of the times they say that the, every time the customer is right, which I don't agree with, but it's almost like you have to talk to them in a sense that they feel like they're right and it's their idea. But at the end of the day, you're also there to guide them to make the right decision. So uh, sometimes the easiest sell is when you're actually uh, legitimate on your answer and you give them the way you think and pretty much say, I'm not trying to take your money. I'm actually trying to talk to you into something that you really need instead of this product, that product but you give them empowerment because at the end of the day, it's their decision, right? But you collaborate with each other. So one of the things that uh, we measure in, uh, in the CRM is something called the CLV, which is the customer lifetime value. This is very, very important. This is when they say that relationship long-term actually makes a difference. So, um, I don't know if you guys have um, noticed that for some of you guys that have experienced like sales experience and things like that, a lot of the times the way relationships start is by saying, oh, this is my first purchase, but throughout the year, I'm going to buy 20, right? Or I'm going to buy 30. And the way they, they the reason they do that is because they want to be able to get some type of discount at the beginning, right? And, and, yeah, you believe in that, you know, the relationship is going to be built and this person is going to buy 20 throughout the year, then you give them a discount, right? So, but that's not usually the case. But what you want to measure right here is customer lifetime value. So by the time you acquire this customer, by the time this person became a customer for you, until the end, you need to know how many times this person purchased. Um, and how much money you actually made per that person. So it could be that, let's say, for example, you have a big customer and they keep coming every three months or every week to buy something from you. Now, you got to look at the lifetime of the customer and you say how much money actually I've made out of this customer. Because it could be that this customer turns out to be a really good customer because they come 
for us 30 times out of the year, but they don't really, um, because we give them so many discounts, they don't really make us actual growth profits, right? So, so those are the things that we need to find out because it could be that this customer that buys 30 times, it's equal to a person that buys five times without the discounts. So, uh, but that's that's one of, that's one of the key measurements that we do with the CRM because we want to know how much uh, profit we actually make out of this customer every year, and it could be um, sometimes we just have one customer, a customer that buys one time a year, but the uh, then you can measure it throughout ten years, right, and make sure that you know this person keeps coming back. Return on customer investment, right, which is how much money I'm spending on this customer and how much money am I getting back? It could be money if you want to calculate it. It could be how many times my sales reps are contacting them. You know, we could calculate some type, some, some type of measurement like that. Uh, so the product, the process cycles for CRM is always analyzing the data that is on, on the software. Why? Because we want to know what are the customers that um, are buying and what are the seasonalities? When do they come back? When, um, how often they come back? Um, how much money do they buy? How much product they buy? How much profit we make out of each one? And what type of product? So this is what we're seeing right here. We do the marketing planning, then we go to the customer interaction, and then we analyze, and then we refine the information that we have, and then we go into knowledge discovery. To give you an example, this could be based on actual um, industries. For example, I get to, you know, once I do my whole research, I get to realize that, let's say, um, the seasonality for football, for uh, basketball, or things like that is like, from this month to this month. So based on that, I could send them some marketing campaigns just based on that knowledge discovery that I did by analyzing who purchased throughout those months. And it could be just on that seasonality. So uh, knowledge discovery, uh, right here, what you see is like uh, customer touch points right here. Uh, customer touch points are actually the points that the customer um, goes through to be able to uh, complete a sale. It could be through the internet, it could be direct selling contacts, or it could be another customer. It's just, how do I get to them? And that's the, the touch point that we're looking for, right? I need to know where that customer came from and um, how did I make contact with him? It could have been because my um, ads on Google, it could have been because I had a, uh, a picture on Facebook, it could have been because, like I said, somebody saw my product in the streets and they want to see it in person. Um, or it could have been that my sales reps contacted them. Um, data warehouse, it's pretty much on the CRM, which contains all the information and touch points that we already talked about, like the whole history of the customer. So that's these are pretty much the the basis of how we're going to get to know the customers and how are we going to be able to segment them, them like right here data mining so when we segment it's actually when we divide them in different groups depending on their categories like we just said basketball players tennis players uh golf players so we segment them in a different uh in different groups so we know what type of information we're going to be sending them and selling to them right so database marketing is the creation of segments, pretty much creating different groups. Phase two to four, it's the marketing planning, right? And the customer interaction that we may have, analysis and refinement. So this is what we cover already on that, on that circle. Um, any questions so far? So uh, on the customer, the, then we go into the customer touch points right here in the interactivity. So um, it could be not interactive. So when we talk about the customers, we've got to make sure that 
uh, what what's the two? It could be an interactive touch point, which is which could be a two way interaction, which is a salesperson, right? Or a person that stops by your house and knocks and tries to get your information. Or it could be through the website. Uh, if we have a little chat in the bottom and they start asking questions and they create that interaction. But it could also be that they see an email campaign that I sent, or it could be just on the website and they create the form. Um, so I'm going to share some information right here. This is the company that I currently work for. And for us, this is our touch point right here. So right here, um, the type of information that we're trying to get. So right here for us, this form is the most important. So when I created this website, you are focusing on what type of information you are trying to get out of the customer. For example, right here you have the name, the company, and these are require fields because you need to know. So uh, so this is name, company, industry, right? Because I want to segment them on my CRM, right? And I want to be able to, to, when this information comes in, it puts them in the certain category already. The address, right? The city, the information, the state, uh, the zip code. Uh, but also, I want to know this question. How did you hear about us, right? Did you see me on YouTube? Did you see me on Facebook, on LinkedIn? Uh, was it a magazine? Was it a web search, right? Uh, and then you go into what type of model they're looking for. And a little bit more. Tell me a little bit more about what type of uh, instrument you're going to be um, combining my product with. So common questions that you're going to see is how did you hear about us? This is for marketing purposes. This is for you to track where the customers are coming from, right? Um, and basically right here, the basic information like the address and things like that. So you know that you could create a map around it and find out where everybody's coming from. So um, so those are, the, that's the, for example, that's the website data entry form and not interactive touch points. They just see my information on the internet and all of a sudden they contact me through the entry form, okay? Um, how do you measure that? You pretty much see how many of them they come a day, right? And then you give a value to each form entry. So it all starts by, I spend you know a certain amount of money on the ad campaigns, and then all of a sudden I see, let's say I get 300 entry forms, then I divide that by the amount of money that I spend. And that gives me a value to a customer. I could say each customer cost me about $12. Now, based on that, if I have 300 customers that I need to contact, then I need to know how many of those turned out to be sales. How many did I close? So now based on that, I could say that I spent $12 per customer, but if I converted that customer, depending on my product, I could say, oh, you know, I only need to close 4%. Or if your, let's say your product is $5 and you're spending $12 per customer, then that means you need to uh, lower your advertising and be able to maximize, you know, your, your returns in here, so. Um, so, uh, when a customer, when a culture in a company, it's, it's customer centric, it's more about, it, it's pretty much thinking that the internal and exter external environment has to be satisfied. It's not so much about making so much money, but it's making sure that every interaction that your company has with them is satisfying for the customer. And once again, a little bit of review from last week is that our first customer is our employees. So employees are important. Why? Because if the employees are happy, then the customers that they're talking with, they will be happy too. So you have to establish this type of culture since the beginning, if that's the type of company that you want. Now, this is something that became a trend because of the CRM customer relationship management. Once that was created, then it became a trend on finding out how we can motivate 
and keep our customers happy. We can motivate our employees so our customer satisfaction goes up. So if you guys have seen that, that seems to be the orientation of this trend of this type of uh, culture right now is that every every company pretty much says we offer really good customer service and they focus on that. So, um, so as marketing manager, you have to be able to establish that culture throughout throughout the whole company. And as a review, remember that we talked about it, um, that we all that we work with all the different departments um, all across. So um, all across because we want to make sure that every single one has that culture, right? That culture on being able to every interaction they have with the customer, they they do a, a good job. So um, we were talking about the, the big data, uh, big data, which is pretty much um, the type of the type of information that you need to be able to contact and segment these type of customers, right? Um, it's easy to categorize, right? Is a logical organization based on on you know what type of uh, information we're getting from them, like right here, um, numeric or text limited to certain input like male, female. So the information that you guys saw um, on on my contact us information right here is the one that I'm going to be used for my big data. It's the information that I'm going to be. Um, input in and put it on a database so I could break it down into okay what are the structures that I'm looking for it's going to you know it's going to be on Excel document that's going to be downloaded from my from my website and I'm going to be able to um, separate it but uh, your your CRM um, is going to be able to give you different categories and different sources for you to be able to analyze that information and put it in different uh, different views and different uh, charts for that. So uh, let me keep going right here. So bottom line, the CRMs are pretty much the systems that are often the central hub of data and can integrate with other applications. What what is what does that mean? It means that your CRM is going to be connected with accounting. Right, it's going to be connected with marketing. It's going to be connected with sales. It's going to be connected with human resources. Right, so every single employee and every single customer has a profile in this CRM. Um, reason why is because now that accounting is going to be able to access the information of the customer, and they're going to be able to tell if. Um, you know, if this person, if this person, how many purchases they have, how much, how much money they owed to accounting, things like that, right? And the sales guys are going to be able to access it just to be able to contact the person, right? So you see how it is all connected to the different departments depending on their use. And for me, for marketing, is going to be able to tell me what type of, what do they like, and how often do I need to per, uh, contact them? So. Um, so it became, you know, a pretty much a business system because um, it connects all the it connects all the departments. And at the end of the day, the customer is the one that benefits because, you know, we're able to we're, we're able to contact um, with the right information. I need to know when you purchase, what did you purchase, and if I could contact you again. Um, if you see me, I'm skipping through some of these because it's really hard to explain to you if you if you have not used a CRM. But um, a lot of these things are very basic in the aspect of once you have a CRM in front of you, which is a customer relationship management system, um, you'll be able to understand that um, any any uh, information that you get from, let's say, social media. Uh, any information that you might get from the internet once you connect all the devices and things like that to understand your customer is going to be set on your CRM because the CRM is pretty much the one that is collecting all this information. And when you target them by marketing, um, you'll be able to you'll be able to um, 
understand the patterns and understand the industry that they're in and understand the type of marketing that you could send. Um, you don't want to send, like I said, to a to a tennis player some basketball um, shoes. You see, this is pretty much the type of information that they're getting. Um, so marketing analytics, and that's that's where it comes down to. So marketing analytics, it's based on all that information that you collected from your customers. Uh, why is that important? It's because now you analyze it and you break it down into being able to make marketing related decisions. It's all of that. It's like it sits right here within the data for the purpose of improving marketing related decisions. And like we said, we're problem solvers. In marketing, we are problem solvers and it's all based on marketing related decisions. Improving marketing related decisions. And it's all coming from the data that we collect from the customers. So, um, so for example, Google and Facebook are the ones that are providing most of this information because it's coming directly through them. Um, it, it's it, they're tracking every single interaction that you have on they they um, that a customer has on your website, and every single interaction that um, that gives you data. So all of that data is what you're going to be using. So I'm going to share some some uh, actual information. Uh, one second, cancel. From the company that I work for, and this is what it looks on on the back end. Let me just tell you. So for example, I can share right here real quick that we have 11 users on the website that I manage. Uh, the type of users, the new users, you can see this this type of interactions, and this is when we talk about Google Analytics or analytics and data. Uh, so we talk about the type of campaigns that you're running to be able to get customers. Are they coming from paid search or they're coming from organic search, which is free? Um, are they coming from referrals? Um, so this is when we talk about marketing and uh, analytics. You get all this information and then you see, OK, what type of engagement are we getting and how many people is coming to new uh, to to see my new uh, new pages or they're coming to see um, how much time they are spending on my website. Right. Like for example, one minute and 23 uh, seconds. Um, how much money I'm spending on this on, on you know, on those 11 users. And how many of those are actually converting into filling up the form that we have in here? Okay. So, um, so that's that's marketing analytics. And then once I have all that information, um, then I will be able to read it and understand it. So. Uh, Marketing, uh, what, what a marketing analyst is, is a highly skilled expert who may be required for complex data. Now, you could make marketing very complicated or you can make it very, very easy. So for me, I try to make it very easy. Reason why is because all I want to know is how many customers, um, how many prospects I have, how many people came to the website, how many phone calls came in, and how many of those turn into sales? How much money I spent on them? And then how much money I got back? So the marketing return inspiration. So, um, so that's pretty much what I do in regards to all the analytics, because I need to know if I'm really making money out of these people. So if I collect, like I said, 300 customers, then I can go ahead and say I closed 150 that's a 50 percent closing rate and based on my product and how much how much profit i need to make for the company then that's pretty satisfying like i said you break it down into how much money you spent by the customer and then all of a sudden you also understand how much money you're making making per then but it but it also depends on how much money you make. I mean, how much money it takes to create the product that you have. Um, a lot of the times 
now we don't we don't act specifically have a tangible product. So now we have um, we have um, we have intangible products which are services, right? Just customer service. So I need to track how much time in services I spend on them uh, to be able to track if I'm making money out of them or not. Now, this one is very important, which is predictive analysis, which is based on your history as a customer. How can I predict what is going to happen after, right? So has it happened to you guys that it say, for example, you guys search online for something and next week you go into the internet or next day and all of a sudden everything is coming up to you. Oh my God. Oh, look, I was searching for that. I was searching for that. So that's what that's what we do as marketers. I understand your patterns. Then I go and I create something just customized from you for you. That's what it's called. Um, the um, the new AI, which is um, pretty much automatic uh, intelligence, which analyzes all your data that you put into the searches. So if I look for tennis shoes, then I know you're looking for tennis shoes and I know and I get to the point where I analyze every touch that you had with my website. So I already know the size of your shoes, the color of shoes that you like, are you a female or male, and what type of preference of shoes do you want, and what type of shirts would you combine with, and things like that. So that's where I'm predictive, and I know that that's what you're going to like. So um, it's very powerful, and you guys have seen it probably, because if you guys interact with Google and if you guys interact with Facebook, you guys have seen the, the immediate response that um, – this artificial intelligence, which is AI, artificial intelligence is doing for us. Automatically, it's predicting what you're doing. So it's not so much, let's say, for example, for a big product, you're doing it automatically by uh, knowing what type of products the customer is buying and how much they are uh, buying from you. But when it comes to a very small little product or searching online, then automatically we have Google or Facebook to chase you in a different way so you buy from us. And that's what happens. So they're automatic uh, email campaigns and automatic um, ads that are showing just for you because they meet this specific criteria. So when it comes to it right here, increased personalization, content filtering, collaborate filtering, it only means I'm going to target this person because now that I know what type of shoes they like, what is their size, and what type of colors they like, now I can create automatically a personalization just for you. And then I only show you the, the content that you want to see. Same in here individual level personalization, I just want that person. Le segment level, I just want that group of people, which could be tennis, or it could be mass personalization. Everybody just wants a similar product to me. Marketing dashboard, it's pretty much um, when you see a CRM, it's actually including all the data uh, from, uh, from all, you know, all interactions that happen, what type of industry, segments, um let's see this is um in a sense let me try to find right here marketing dashboard crm i feel like we need to have some type of visual in this sense okay so look at this example right here can you guys see it okay so um, an example right here of a marketing um, dashboard, CRM. We're actually seeing where, you know, where your campaigns, you know, the average cost that we're having per customer, how many of those have converted into actual sales, right? Uh, how many are qualified, what type of the world, where in the world they are, right? And where they came from. 
Some came from social media, some came from emails, some came from the AdWords, and some came from webinars. So that this dashboard is pretty much created by us. We come here and we analyze how much money, how much revenue. So for example, this is this is from directly from a CRM. This is a customer relationships management called Salesforce. And what they track is the sales revenue per customer, right? And then um, quote closing, right? How many of those quotes that you created actually became into sales? Um, and what type of product was selling, right? Is it going up or is it going down? And then right here, what is called opportunities is actual customers. So this gives you a better idea on how it's going to look when you are in that CRM. Uh, it gives you all the breakdown per customer and it gives you all the information that you need to know. Let's say, for example, right here next to the opportunities right here where it says the name of the customer, um, you have the value and that's what we're looking for, the value of that specific customer. Based on that value, you could budget for next year and then you can see this is how much I'm going to be making. Um, any questions on this one? Um, any questions on that PowerPoint? Have you, has any of you guys worked with the, something similar, some the CRM? Hello? <laughs> That's chapter number five. Yeah, let me know if, if you um, um, say if you you work with um with the CRM before. Yeah, yeah, I have. Like, okay, and and so what type of what type of information do you um when you used it or when you use it? What type of information are you looking for um from there? Or what is it that you're trying to collect? Uh, let's say. The CRM I used was like an analytics for a website. So I looked at how long customers stayed on that website, what pages did they visit, what buttons did they click the most often, just to gain an understanding of how they're interacting with the website. And if they're leaving quickly, why? Or what page do they get stuck at and leave? Okay. And that gives you, did you use that for, um design purposes um, it was mostly after the website was already made just to make it better just to see okay. where can we improve it what are the customers actually looking for that's great yep that that that's a lot of good feedback because um that's the key for creating a really healthy website a lot of the times we see that they come to this page and they drop especially now that everything is through the website. So, so for example, in that creation, you could be like, oh, I'm changing the colors. I'm adding a different call to action, a different button, or I'm changing the information on that website, making it easy. Why, why are they dropping like safe set? So we have to understand the customer experience and the, you got to think about it this way. Um, you are creating a path for a person to come, you know, have a good time in your website. And if they don't find what they're looking for and they don't create that path that they're, you know, that they're expecting to see, then they're going to lose. Um, then they're going to lose interest and they're going to drop, right? As you guys already know, the websites are fairly fast. So you go through five different websites quickly right, if you don't find what you're looking for. Okay, so does anybody else have worked with uh, CRMs? Anybody else that want to comment on that and how they've used CRMs before? Okay, so um, let's move into this section that we call the soft skills. Uh, and I want to open it up for you guys. It's motivation. Motivation is the soft skill today. Um, it could be uh, business motivation or just motivation in general self-motivation what is it and why do you guys think it's important so i need somebody that hasn't participated shan ollie mansoor 
Ahmed, Jordan, what is motivation and what, um, why do you guys think it's a soft skill that you need to have as a leader? Is there anybody on the other side? <laughs> Jodeline, are you there? Ollie, all right, safe. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to ask a question by motivation. Are you talking like within a firm? Like what motivates employees or what motivates yeah, a customer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a leader, as a leader, what, what, um, why is motivation needed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, obviously, there's the financial aspect. Every employee wants to be compensated accordingly. <laughs> but I think it goes beyond that. I think in today's day and age, a lot of employees want to know that they're doing meaningful work, that they work for a firm that aligns with their own personal values. So you have to look at all the intangibles of not just how much you're paying them, but you have to look at the nature of the work, uh, the state of the firm itself, what are they doing, and just trying to find the underlying reasons that would make somebody actually enjoy a workplace, right? Correct, 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 correct. So, so yes, um, it, it's so important to be able to know um, that uh, your employees are motivated to show up every day, right? And it's up to you on how you create that perfect environment for them. Now, with that said, um, it's not only monetary, right? It's not only about how much money you're making uh, that is going to keep them motivated. There is times where you can raise them, uh, you can give them more money and more money, but that doesn't change the environment that they're in, right? You could come show up and hate your job and make more money every time because you think that's the answer. But at the end of the day, you come back home and you hate what you do. So that's not what we're looking for. But there is times, there is times, for example, that um, companies offer, you know, a gym inside of their facility, right? Or they offer, instead of money, they say, oh, we're going to, give you uh, the opportunity to have a one hour lunch, right? And we pay you for lunch and we, and we, um, we pay, we buy you lunch every day. Uh, it could be understanding what the, their, you know, their personal problems are, which could be as simple as, I don't have anybody to take care of my kid, right? Then, then let me try to help you and solve that problem. It's not necessarily monetarily, but that could be a problem. It could be that this person says, I don't really have time for myself. I'm so involved with my family. I'm so involved with work and school and things like that. And then once you listen to those things, then you realize it's not really about money. It's really about time. So do me a favor, you know, take these 10 minutes and read a book or something like that, that you could help them with during the whole thing. So, but uh, the main goal when we're, when we're in leadership it's actually through motivation to be able to, uh, it's called like the process that initiates, guides, and maintains goal-oriented behaviors, right? So we want to be able to keep, we want to be able to push our people and even push ourselves through self-motivation to make sure that the goals are being met. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for, in a sense, that we could go ahead and if we have our goal, change the behaviors needed to be able to get to that goal. And that's what we're looking for in motivation. So um, we all have moments where, where we need motivation, um, where we need to wake up and say, okay, I need to go because I'm motivated by this. So always try to find that reason. So when it comes to, um, when it comes to motivation, it allows us to change behaviors, right? develop competencies, set goals, um, make plans, develop in, you know, um, talents, and boost engagement. 
right? If a person is motivated, motivated, they'll engage more. If a person is ready to um, to be there and change that behavior, they will go ahead, participate, and be more innovative in every aspect. Okay, so um, all right, it's um, it's six fifty seven. Let's go ahead and uh, take a five minute break before we jump into the second chapter. Um, I'll see you guys in a little bit. So let's take about five minutes. Um, so let's go back. Uh, for me, it's six. It's a minute fifty eight. Let's go back in a minute. Um, minute three. Is that okay. Can you make it eight minutes, please? Say that again, Jolene. Eight minutes, please. Eight minutes. Eight minutes, yeah, minutes please. Let's do, let's do eight minutes. Okay. Eight Thank minute you. break. All right.
Shan, how are you? Yes, uh, how are you? I'm fine. Sir. Sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, um, have a good week? Yes, sir, uh, right. I, I was a little late, sir, <laughs> for this lecture because of my oh, condition no. is not as serious. No problem, but, but you're, but you're in now. Uh, I'm yeah. in Yamasa, sir, Yangon, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Winnie, how are you? Uh, hello. Hello, yeah, how are you? Okay, let's return to um, to uh, what we were just with. Some of them just showed up, so um, we were just talking about motivation. And Mansoor, also, how are you? You could uh, collaborate with the participation in here. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna go through a series of questions, or just one question, and I need some participation on this one. How does um, your culture or your family and friends affect on your decision making when it comes to purchasing something. So can somebody help me to understand how do my friends or family affect my decision making when it comes to purchasing something? All right. Safe, go ahead. I can go for this. Yeah. But Safe raised his hand first, so. No, no, it's all yeah. good, it's all good. You can go, it's all good. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, um, I can say that uh, my purchasing um, decisions were affected from my family, uh, my father, mother, sister. Uh, we, since there is sometimes a lot of options, so we take our time uh, fine, you know, going through this and that, and uh, let's see this, this something there, it might be better. So we take a lot of time to decide. And that, and that comes from, from your family. It's not necessarily your culture. Is it your culture? Uh, no. Well, uh, I cannot say culture. Uh, it's mainly, mainly uh, my family. I Maybe take a lot family. of time. Yeah, take I take a lot of time. Okay, okay. And, to and decide to buy ask... one simple thing. <laughs> and do you also get that? Um, do you also ask for their opinions? Well, I I do with my wife. Okay, with your wife. Yeah, she's the one that manages the money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Safe. What do you think? Yeah. But Perfect we. Aspect, I, I usually. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead, Safe. Uh, I was just gonna say. I think the attitude your oh, your parents have towards finances plays a huge part on your perception of like what you're gonna spend. If your parents were like if they would spend a lot or they or they are okay with going out and buying stuff all the time you're more likely to grow up and be have have a more liberal mindset when it comes to spending but if you had frugal parents that will definitely affect the way you behave it might even affect it in the opposite direction let's say you mm -hmm. grew up with really strict parents who were extremely frugal as soon as you have money of your own you might spend it more than you than normal that's right. That's right. That's that. That's exactly right. So, um, what about what about your friends? Okay, right here we have Danny, and she said, "For me, my mother affected my decisions most. 
She helped me to pursue my highest priority list to buy when I need. Sorry. Um, so, so, so here's what happened. So we, we have our influence, like you said, um, it might be too good or it might be too bad because we, um, we tend to prioritize and help us identify what's actually a need and what's actually a want. Do I really want it? Do I really need it? Right now, let me ask the next question. Do your friends have any influence on your purchasing decisions? Somebody that hasn't participated. Jodeline, are you back? Or yeah, who, who back? So okay. as for me, uh, sometimes yeah. we discuss with our friends, um, but sometimes uh, we never, <clears throat> because uh, we don't have uh, sometimes same suggestions. Uh, something what we would like to, but when we meet each other, or maybe for example, like a trip, when we plan it, uh, at the time we need to um, discuss uh, with them uh, what we should buy it, rather than we usually suggest or maybe discuss uh, each other. Sometimes their experience or maybe their uh, knowledge is better from, um, than me, that's why I usually accept it. Uh, so that's it, we need to negotiate each other and we collect the information, so what is the best for us. Yes. Thank you. Sir. Okay. No, thank you. So, so he, here's a very interesting thing. The reason why I'm asking these questions is because next PowerPoint is going to show us that. Uh, if you realize what we just said is, yes, our family, friends, you know, especially when we're younger, right? Because they might have the shoes that we want or they have, uh, they're wearing certain clothes and things like that. And it drives us to buy. Uh, to be similar to them, especially when we're younger. But like Shan just said, it depends because I might I might not have the same economic situation that my friend has, so I might not be able to afford that type of product. But then I could buy something that is a lower end and it looks very similar, right? That happens when you're smaller. But like Ahmed and and Safe just said, it's just it also comes with your family. Um, who is the decision making in your house? So those are the things that are really important to analyze not only for yourself, you know, and your budgeting and, and things like that, but also for marketing perspectives. So the next PowerPoint that we're going to see is actually very in a, interested in that aspect because it helps us to understand how did I make this decision and how did I come about that? Uh, Jodelin, you wanted to participate on this, so you're trying to type. So. Um, the reason it, it's it's crucial to understand on why I'm buying this and how am I buying it and why do I need it? So what we try to find first is what's the problem that we're actually trying to solve. And that's why I'm going to share this um, screen to share the next PowerPoint. <laughs> Okay, so please confirm that you guys see my screen right. One person, that, please confirm. Yes, sir. we can see, sir. Okay. Perfect. So, look, I appreciate the value of knowing your customer, right? I appreciate the differences between you know business to customer, or business to business understand the customer decision making process. So uh, what is it that we're looking for? Like we just said last class, we're trying to deliver value. We're trying to deliver actual features that are going to be working for them, that are going to be good for them. So um, it's not so much about understanding, oh, this person likes this color, it's got to be red. Uh, no, it's actually what's the value that is behind it and how they need how they came up um, with that with that decision, right? So uh, right here in this module, you see that is marketing activities affect customers, decision process, process, right? Value proposition, distribution, marketing communication. Look at the other one: environmental forces, uh, economic, customer decision process, economics, technology, political. So if you realize, I might have. A decision that I want to buy some some you know headphones because you know I got a new cell phone I want some headphones to go with that but 
my economic position is not there, right? Or technology. I really like the, the, the headphones that came out, but they're only accessible in the United States or in China or, you know, in India. So I need to try to get them. But depending on my economy and my political aspect, the political part of it, the environment doesn't allow those headphones to come to my country. So that's part of the problem. But that all affects your marketing decisions. And when you understand this, then you understand the type of customer you're going after. So it all starts by having a problem, my problem recognition. Um, it could start by simply saying, what type of shoes do I like? And I need new shoes, right? I have a problem. The only shoes that I have broke, I need new shoes. Then you go into searching information. Okay, yeah, let me see what type of search uh, I could find, what type of, let's, let's say we do it on the internet. I go on the internet and I search for shoes, right? And then all of a sudden I move into the next, which is the evaluation of alternatives, which is finding different type of options. Okay, which type of shoes do I want? Do I like them red? Do I like them blue? Do I like them Nike, Adidas, Reebok, you know? And then I go into the product choice, um, choice decision, which is, okay, that's the product that I want, then I buy it. And then we go into something called the post-purchase assessment, which is once I purchase it, then I realize did it bring all the values that I wanted? Did it bring all, did it have all the features that I wanted? Are these shoes comfortable? So in here, it shows the internal factors, which is like personal characteristics, psychological attributes, and also the external factors, which is what we just talked about, the cultural, situational, and social. So um, this is great for our own, you know, uh, buying power too. Like for example, we're used to buying something just because we want to now understand that every single purchase has to come with the problem recognition. So like we just said, some of, uh, some of us right here in class, we understood it because of our parents. Some of our parents actually said, do you really need it? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Can you use that money for something else? Can you reinvest it and put it on some type of uh, some type of something retirement instead of just going for for expenses right here? So personal characteristics like demographics, like personal characteristics, life cycle stage, which is age. What are the educate? What's the education that you have? Right, occupation income, lifestyle, gender. So all of that has to do with your decision making. We could talk about education. Um, it, it's somewhat weird, but the people that is highly educated tend to sometimes not even care about what type of clothes they're wearing. You know, they're so highly educated that they think I should be spending that money somewhere else. I shouldn't be buying new clothes and I shouldn't be intimidated by somebody else that is wearing this specific clothes or driving this specific car. Let's say, for example, an occupation. If you sell houses, for example, in the United States, if you sell houses, you better have a nice car because you're driving into customers' car, car houses. And also, you're driving sometimes the customers go inside of your car, so you better have a good car. So that's the occupation, right? Uh, it could also be, let's say you're a taxi driver, you better have a nice car, right? The income, decision-making, income, um, how much money you make. If you're not making that much money, then that's part of your decision-making. That's when you look at the, the type of options that, that there are, are there. So lifestyle and gender, right? Gender, depending on your gender, you pick different things. But those are the personal characteristics that you're going to look. Moving to motivation, right? What motivates you to buy things, right? Is it your family? Is it your friends? Uh, is it your job, right? Uh, motivation because of your job could be, I'm standing all day, I'm working, I work standing up all day, so I need shoes that are comfortable, right? I need uh, things that are going to help me be at my work and I'd be comfortable. Right, my personality has to do uh, perception, attitude. All of that 
it's really hard to read on a some, something called the CRM, right? Because we're at this is actually more personable and more knowledgeable once you get to know your customers. So so you have to understand what motivates them. What's the attitude that they have about it? What's the personality that they have? What's their perception? Um, so right here, it's pretty much the definition into like types of values when it comes to cultural values, uh, personal values. Um, so yes, let's say for example, everything starts at home. You know, my father, my mother, they wear uh, this type of clothes, they dress this type of way, they talk this type of way. But we cannot deny that also there is cultural values and beliefs that are around you, right? That really change you. It, and those are the, the ones that when you're growing up, you question your, your family, right? You question the type of things that they that they do because, oh, my friends do this. You know, the people from church do this. The people from my school do this. The people from the park do this. So um, then you start creating your own cultural values depending on that. And then your attitudes and motivations start changing based on uh, based on you know, based on, on, on the culture, right? So when it comes to perception, you actually um, selective awareness, right? You have selective distortion, selective retention. So perce perception is a system to select, organize, and interpret information to create a useful, informed picture of the world. Now, perception is how you want to see it. And how is it going to see it? It depends on the experience that you have with the things that have happened to you. So, for example, I love um, extreme sports, right? But I only had one experience and it didn't go that well. Let's say you rode a, a bicycle and you did a jump and you felt and you broke your arm. Then you create a perception that all extreme sports are dangerous and I never want to know anything about it but I'm aware about it, right? And based on that, I'm never going to go and be part of the market. So that's just a perception. Um, now, with that said, there is also something called perception on like when our mind somewhat lies to us because we tend to be selective on a brand that we like or a product that we like, and all of a sudden, everything else doesn't exist. And it's just our mind playing games on us. Now, learning any change in content, organization, long term memory, or behavior conditioning creates an association between two stimuli classical conditioning, operant conditioning. Remember when we were talking about, about education, education in, in a product, in a service, in a, in a moment that you say, um, Am I am I really interested in this product or not? Right? I, do I require more information? Uh, what I told you guys last week, and I heard this recently, where a customer doesn't need more time to make a decision; it just really needs more information. So think about that again. A customer doesn't really need more information. I mean, they don't really need more time to think about something. They just really need more information. So part of learning, it's that is being able to educate a person to be able to teach them on how to make the decision. Personality, right? Um, personality is each person has a set of consistencies and during personal characteristics, right? They do that all the time or those characteristics can be measured to identify differences between individual. So the personality is a set of unique personal qualities that produce distinctive responses across similar situations. So how do we know personalities? It depends on the situations because I might be the most brave on jumping from an airplane, but if I see a spider, I might get scared. So it all depends on that situation, right? So. Um, and it all depends on your personality and, and, and the type of people that you hang out with at, at times, like different people that are around you. This is what we see also on culture, right? Culture, which is, it, it involves language, right? Your values, 
nonverbal communication, subcultures. So this is how much it affects you, right? It affects you in a sense that your culture has values, has morals, beliefs, the art, you know, the law and customers. So, uh, so for example, there's cultures that are very customer oriented. There's culture, cultures that are very profit oriented. I need to make money and that's all. And if my, my, my family has to eat before yours, um, or I, I don't really care about what you think, are you going to buy it or not? So it all depends on that culture, but also from your perspective, uh, there might be culture that says, I'm really all about United States and I don't buy any product that comes from the outside. Right. And that was some of the backlash that, for example, when, uh, when the Chinese started bringing products here, one of the things that it was more pride is, you know, oh, it was made in the United States. So although there is some people that appreciate it, there are some people that say, oh, I'm, I'm going to go with Vietnamese product, with Taiwanese products. I don't, you know, they're really good quality too. So it's all about learning and, and, and be able to shape those concepts to your, um, to your people. Now, look at this, physical surroundings, personal circumstances, timing. Now, we, we don't only think that our family and our, you know, our friends make impact on our decision making, but we could also see, we could also think on the physical aspect of it. For example, if my country, it rains a lot, that is going to make me choose the type of clothing I pick, right? If it is snows, I need to choose different clothing, right? It also changes the type of sports that you might play. It changes the type of way you walk. So all these things are really interesting to understand, okay, what's the physical surroundings, right? Where the personal circumstances, there are some countries that we walk to work, right? We don't have a bicycle, we don't have a car. Then we walk, so what are my personal circumstances? That's what is the timing, right? What was the timing during the whole COVID-19? What the type of products and what's the timing that we're trying to offer, right? So right here, what we have is like external factors that shape our customer decisions, which is the social, where we have the family, household life cycle, right? Because it might be that when I'm younger, when I'm young, I could make some type of decisions on the clothing that I need. But when I go into, you know, when I have family, let's say my first kid is born, then I need to make different decisions, right? This person is not thinking about them anymore. They're thinking about the kids and do they need shoes? It's not about me. And who is helping to make those decisions, right? If you guys have noticed, let's say, for example, for me in the United States, they have actually targeted the kids more than the parents. And since forever, they have actually showed ads on how to um, um, <clears throat> influence the kids more than the actual parents because the parents are the ones that are going to, you know, be convinced by the kids. So social class, <clears throat> opinion leaders, um, there are primary groups and secondary groups. Primary groups are the ones that are marked frequent contact with you, like your family, your wife, your kids. Secondary groups could be your cousins. It could be your friends, right? Um, but it, it all comes down to that emotional connection that you might have with that group. Reason why is because there is some type of emotional connection. Let's say, for example, everybody's wearing a red shirt for Christmas. Well, now you end up buying a red shirt, right? Because you don't want to be the only one that is not involved in that. So uh, moving into that, involvement and influences, right? High involvement in learning, low involvement in learning, and involvement in general. Just the aspirational focus, the environment. Right. Is your environment really more into going to school, going to university, or is your environment more into entrepreneurial? Right. I got to create companies. I got to go to work. Um, all of that affects that. So keep this in mind, this process right here, use it for your own purposes. Use it for marketing, but also use it for your personal purchases. Uh, this is something that I do myself. I recognize the problem. Okay, so I need to, um, and this is probably what Ahmed does with his family, um, because they take a long time to find the, the solution to the problem. 
but it all starts by problem recognition. A lot of the times we go backwards. We just walk in by and we see a shoes that we like and we just buy it, right? And we go like, well, why am I buying it? What's the problem, right? So we start with problem recognition, search for information, evaluation of alternatives, product choice decision, and purse purchase decision. Can you guys still hear me okay? Hello, can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah. Sure. Okay, perfect. So um, right here, um, so based on these, which is the problem recognition, search for information, evaluation of alternatives, product choice decision, post purchase decision. Now, don't forget to not skip the search for information. A lot of the times, um, our emotions get through this and they go right away to product decision. So that's when we make those choices that we go, oh, I didn't really need that. And that's when we make the problem. That's, that's when we create a problem for ourselves sometimes economically. Or sometimes we look back into our closet and we realize that we have too much, right? Or we go into our garage and we realize that we have too much. It's because we skip that search for information and the evaluation of alternatives. So that's why I say that it's also good for your personal um, personal purchases. Also, remember when it comes to this, and this we reviewed last week, all the all decisions are actually emotional. I know there is times where we start being very rational about our decisions. This is how much I make. This is how much the product is. This is how much is going to get me. These are the alternatives. This is the type of product I want. Now, all the numbers might add up and say, yeah, that's the product that you need. But at the end of the day, there is a point where it says, okay, um, I really don't like that color, so I'm going to go this way. So your emotions have everything to do. At the end of the day, the emotions is the one that I place for the most important. So searching for information, limited information, extensive search. So it all depends on you what type of search you want to do. But also, you know, I recommend it. Say it if it's more expensive, you have an extensive information search, right? If it's something that it's, let's say in our case in the United States, it's $1 compared to $100. You have to think about it uh, different time, uh, different ways and type of information that you're looking for, right? Internal information, which is, let's say, your family. External information could be outside sources, right? So when you when you think about these things, is it's very impressive on how we make decisions every day. So we make decisions at every moment. You wake up, do you make your bed? You don't make your bed. You brush your teeth, you don't brush your teeth. Do you shower? You don't shower. What shoes do you wear? So if you realize there are so many things that are influencing our decisions every day, you know, I'm going to give you an example. If you're not married, you might not do the bed, right? Because you're living by yourself and you wake up and, you know, it's okay to come back to a bed like that. But if you, let's say you're going to work, then the decision making changes on the type of shoes that you wear, right? It could be tennis shoes or it could be elegant shoes. The type of, so, so if you realize, um, uh, that the, all the decisions are being questioned by something, right? And at the end of the day, it's like that emotional choice, but also with something in your mind, in the back of your mind. So based on what you're going to do next. So it's very impressive when you think about it's not only your family, but also like it says right here, your physical surroundings, your social circumstances, the timing, state of mind. Listen to that one, a state of mind. There is times where we wake up, it's Sunday. I don't want to wear a tie, right? I'm just going to be in bed, so I'm just going to wear my PJs all day. Or it might be that I don't really feel like dressing up, so I just put some uh, sweatpants and just go outside. So this is part of the decision-making and influencing. Why are we understanding this? Why are we understanding this? is because we want to see it from the customer point of view every single time. We want to be able to know what 
where, how much they want to spend, when they're going to spend it, and all that stuff. They, we want to be able to know what's making them make those decisions. So if I understand that people work mainly from Monday to Friday, then Saturday and Sunday, they're going to be wearing some sweatpants, they're going to be wearing PJs because they're going to do uh, pajamas because they're going to be in bed all week, all day. Then that's the type of uh, advertising that I'm going to throw at them. If I understand their culture, I know that in December they gather together and they tend to wear the same clothes. OK, now I know what the patterns are when it comes to purchasing, right? So I recommend that you guys go through this PowerPoint on your own as well. Uh, to be able to understand, um, you know, the purchasing decisions and what makes it, um, you know, very, um, very important in the sense of, you know, um, in in the sense in the sense of your purchasing decisions and and in your house, you have to realize is it my wife the one that is making the decisions for purchasing, or is it me, or is it my kids that are influencing me to purchase? Right. Now we move into something that is called um, uh, demand. Demand is it all. It all depends on if it's something called how. How is it that my demand is changing? When you are in marketing and you're in produce uh, in manufacturing, your demand changes a, a lot of times. Um, why? It could be internal and external environments. Internal could be that we do not produce fast enough, right? And that is a problem. And my customers are not coming back or my demand is not being met because of that. Or it could be external because people don't want to buy my product anymore. Or simply the weather is not good for the type of product that is sell. Now there's something called the elastic and inelastic demand. I'm going to show. So right here, elastic and inelastic demand. So when we have an elastic demand, it's actually when, um, when let's say I change the price of a product by one percent then my demand changes drastically and when it's inelastic it's actually when i change my product price by one percent it doesn't change does that make sense so it's elastic when let's say for example my product goes from ten dollars to eleven and all of a sudden i see that my demand drops right a lot of people stop buying but if I raise it from $10 to $11 and the same amount of customers keep coming back, then um, that will be inelastic. So that's what you want to understand when it comes to uh, when it comes to products. So in this chart, you can see the quantity changes. If I lower the price, right? If I go from price two to price one, my quantity of purchasing changes because it's it's elastic, right? Um, but it also, what you want to see is, does it make sense for me to lower my price and get more customers based on how much profit, be, profit I want to make per customer? So we have inelastic and elastic demand. Um, once again, now, I don't know why this jump, but this buying, buying situations is nature of the purchase one going back to purchasing decisions uh number of purchase number of people involved with the decision understanding the product being purchased and the time frame for decision what are the buying situations right it's any new purchase it's a modified rebuy or straight rebuy where i just repurchase the product or i modify my search when it comes to repurchasing that specific product Maybe I don't want the model one. Now I might want the model two, or I just I'm just looking for a new product. Now, in here, buying center members, which is we have to understand 
how the idea started, who are the ones that are actually going to push me to buy it, which are the influencers, or which ones are the gatekeepers, right? Sometimes it's our significant other, like uh, Ahmed was saying, it could be my wife, it could be, or it could be your husband, the one that is gatekeeping and saying, "Uh uh-uh, we don't need it, we're not going to buy it. So once you understand all those aspects from your customers, um, then you'll be able to influence them in a different way to be able to make those, right? Who is part of the buying center? Who are the most significant influencers? What are the decision criteria for evaluating the various product options? And then buying center target market. So um, see how it is so important to to actually understand how we make the decisions. Um, I'm going to skip this second part of the PowerPoint, so make sure that you look at it because this is pretty much the same thing, but now we're looking into business markets. And business markets are related to government, institution, resellers, but it all ends up in similar situation when it comes to the decision making, right? Now, the, the only difference is that you're going to search for new vendors or simply for proposals or government help or things like that. So look at this second section of the PowerPoint and understand what this is, what the difference between decision making between a business and a person could be. So uh, glance through this um, and understand that a little bit better. Now, it is extremely similar to those two different concepts. Reason why is because um, it's because the only thing that differs between a person and a business um, is just simply the type of vendors that you want to work with. So the different people in different situations that are external and global um, to be able to understand, you know, what vendor is going to give me a better price and a better product, but it is still the same situation. You, it all starts with a problem, right? In a company, as a business, I have to understand that I need new machines to be able to produce faster. Then I look for somebody, alternatives, right? Then I look to make a decision and then I do a review. If I don't like that product, then I change it and then you keep going with your business but it's essentially the same thing from the personality or the other thing. And there is also influences, which could be external influences or global influences um, that affect your decision-making as a a business, right? Because as a business, it's easier to say, I'm going global because I know I could buy the machine, uh, a better machine in Taiwan, you know, especially coming, let's say, to the U.S., than just buying it directly from the United States because profitability, maybe I'll be, I might be able to buy it more inexpensively in, in a different country and bring it to the United States that if I was to buy it in the United States, it's going to take me a little bit longer to be able to make that purchasing decision. All right, guys, so uh, any questions so far? So what we covered today was um, CRM, you know, customer relationship management. We cover motivation and how we're going to keep our customers and employees motivated at all times, simply as a um, as a soft skill that we should have as leaders. So if we cover all of our soft skills, we have um, integrity, motivation, and we have empathy. Empathy was the fact of putting yourself on their shoes, um, integrity, doing the right thing, and know what is convenient, and motivation is pretty much being able to change a behavior based on the goal. All right, guys, that's what I have for today. Make sure that you guys review the, the PowerPoints and make sure that you guys uh, review this video if you guys wanna see it again, so, so if you guys have any questions. Like I said, next Sunday, we're going to cover chapter seven and eight, but um, then I'll put the assignment up once we cover all the seven PowerPoints um, to be able to do that. Um, Everybody, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you so much for attending the class today. 
Uh, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. If not, thank you so much for, for coming to class and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay. Zane, for thank participating. You. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you Sean. Have a nice weekend. You too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jodalyn. Dawn, thank you. Have a great day. All of you, I got your email. Thank you.